Hewitt, and that is Professor Charles Hopkins. And Professor Charles Hopkins has been a long-standing friend, uh, advocate, and supporter of the network for, for many, many years. Charles attends all our, our conferences and has made very, very significant uh, contributions to our understanding of ESD and the global context within the international kind of environmental educational context as well. Charles is the UNESCO Chair in Reorientating Education Towards Sustainability. He, Charles also coordinates two UNESCO networks, the International Network of Teacher Education Institutions and the Indigenous Education for Sustainable Development Network. Charles is also a co-director of the Asia Pacific Institute of ESD, which is based in Beijing in China. And Charles has been an international speaker in many countries, in over 90 countries in recent years. And just to let you know how much he's valued, he also holds three honorary doctorates and four honorary professors. <laughs> That's some resume for one man, isn't it? So I'm delighted to ask Charles to give some insights. He's going to talk for about 10 minutes and give some insights on his view of the current situation and the post-COVID issue around education and sustainability. And at the end of that, we will have some questions and discussions. And then I will introduce our second speaker for another short input for our discussion. Is everybody okay with that? So, over to you, Charles, and it's a pleasure to have you and to hear your voice again today. Uh, great. Thank you very much. And if <clears throat> can uh, uh, enable my screen sharing, please, so I can, uh, uh, I can move up. Uh, thank you, Martin. And uh, uh, my congratulations, really, to the LTM. Um, for hosting this and beginning this discussion around education for sustainable development and and as uh, as we come back into uh, into education i would uh, <clears throat> um Olympi, can you uh, open up my screen so i can share please uh, yeah. You can share it whenever you want. Just press the share button on the bottom and then uh, select the presentation if it is on your computer. No, it says the host is disabled. I'm trying to share. <laughs> uh, okay, just one second, Charles. Yeah. And in the meantime, I'd also like to, uh, to thank the other institutions and organizations who have promoted this webinar. I know uh, the... And TEI and TSNAP and so on uh, have all uh, all tried to bring uh, as many people together as possible. Thank you. We're able to to get the uh, the screen up as well. Uh, if you if you look at uh, go ahead. Ah, great. The, uh, the United Nations has sort of looked at the pandemic as, and seen that it is, uh, it is embracing so much of, of the world. And if we look at our particular aspect of education for sustainable development, and we, we look at uh, 13 of the 17 goals uh, are, seem to be affected directly by the pandemic. And uh, so the idea this morning of looking at our, the expertise that's within our organizations around education for sustainable development, what can we contribute to, uh, to coming back? Now, it seems as though there are two aspects of, of coming back that we hear in, in, in society around us. The first one is, how can we get back to normal? Right? How, how can we get back to where we were? But then there's another feeling of how can we build back better? In the private sector here in Canada, the, the ones with the, uh, the environmental aspects to it, the sort of the clean industries, they're saying, how can we have a clean reset? What can we learn from what has gone on? And how can we find something positive 
out, out of what we've learned from the pandemic, whether it is um, identifying weaknesses in society. I think around the world, we have seen what has happened in old folks' homes and, and in group homes and so on, where people are, are forced to, to be in confinement. What is happening in, in poverty and in slums and the spread and so on. And so we, we keep talking about a whole of society response. And of course, that indicates that well, along with whole of society is what can we do within our education systems. Now, there are some things within our education systems that may be a temporary uh, uh, change when we come back, but there are some other things that may be much more permanent. And so how do we begin the discussion about what do we do? How can we build on that? What have we learned? I love the beginning discussion about online learning and uh, online teaching. And uh, there's, uh, there are so many aspects. On the one hand, yes, we, we can reach remote parts of Canada, especially in the last uh, week, a new satellite went up or a rocket went up with 60 different satellites so that these are spreading out. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but these things are spreading out in a pattern so that we can um, reach remote parts of the world. We, we look at uh, the importance of socialization and of mental health. We hadn't realized that until we started looking into the online learning. What is it that that uh, students are missing, so on. So that is something that we will need to take, uh, take part in. But there are some other big shifts. I think now parents realize what it is like to have a classroom of 30 plus students and uh, to be with them the, the whole day. There may be a new appreciation, but there's also what is creeping back in is the responsibility of the learner we had up until the pandemic we had more and more seen the responsibility of the teacher to reach out and to educate the child now what we are looking at is the responsibility of the student themselves to take charge of their own learning which is a good thing and perhaps the engagement of parents and so on there are also the ideas of what is changing in the world around us it, you know, are the changes in, in the world of work, are these temporary, are they long-term? What are the implications for technical and vocational education? What are the new skills that people are going to, uh, to need? Um, and so on. And, and the whole idea of the interaction of humanity, you know, of our, our missing and, and actually being with one another. So to stimulate the discussion, we put together and this is from, you know, institutional change, uh, ad adaptation from uh, uh, change in the world of work and just change theory. But the whole idea that what we as education for sustainable development people, as well as being great educators ourselves, but having this additional expertise, what can we bring to the discussion that uh, that will certainly evolve over the next little while. So the idea of, you know, we talk about the whole school approach in ESD, and if we talk about the whole school approach in building back better, we begin to see some kind of, of overlap. The idea of collaboratively learning to bring about change, the idea of peer exchange as to what we are doing ourselves this, uh, today, um, of beginning the dialogue and beginning the dialogue between schools, between countries, and between philosophical approaches to education, so on. So the, the idea of, of engagement, but in the whole school, it's not just about the teacher in the classroom. It, it is about the curriculum that's been set. It, it is about the responsibility of, of, from the, our, our, our employers to, to, uh, to contribute as well. So all of this, including in particular the research as we learn our, uh, our way forward. So if we build this though, this change that is out there, 
how can we get a voice by saying that, look, we, we are talking about quality education. This is the number one goal of our education system. And it is what is also needed. Our education systems have said, yes, this is what uh, we have pledged to do in implementing SDGs. Well, the concept of inclusive, equitable, quality education is oh, there. Our particular aspect is the idea of education. And also, of course, global citizenship education. So when we begin our discussion, we're not coming in as a, as a small lobby group. We are saying, let's approach our, our return from COVID and also integrate it with the need to address SDG4. We can also show, like from that very first slide that I showed, of how the pandemic affects all different aspects of the sustainable development goals, the UN has realized that SDG4, educators, us, how this in, in, in links to all the other SDGs as well. So what would, if we are going to approach this kind of synergy, Let's start the discussion this morning about, or this afternoon, I, you know, we're in different parts of the world, I'm sorry. Wherever we are, it's time for a Guinness, all right? But at any rate, if we look down the side of the COVID issues, we know we're, we're almost certain that there will be funding cuts. Our countries have greatly overspent in trying to recover, and usually education uh, is cut afterwards. We, you know, we, we experience that. But how can we adapt to the funding cuts by being there ready to say, look, we can save if we retrofit schools for energy, water, waste management, the kinds of things we're doing, there are eco-efficiencies that, that would be there. If we're looking at, at working conditions, um, then we can look at teaching opportunities of sharing with others in the, in the community. How can we build the online into this? We look at the uh, other aspects of, uh, of you know, the pandemics and, and risk reduction is, is something that we would look at what are the learnings from COVID, but then we can look at resilience and other sustainability uh, principles and issues. So we can take the, the part of, of the pandemic, but how can we build on this and make it more generalized and preparing ourselves for other issues that are, that are going to be there? The pandemic is just one. We know that at least a billion people are likely to be moving either within their country uh, or largely out of country uh, due to climate change. How do we begin now to, uh, to address not only the uh, prevention of them having to move, but mitigation and adaptation to that? So in building back better than the discussion, I would like to think about uh, what can educators do in supporting society? What are the, and what are the particular societal changes that we welcome? And, and where we're involved and can support with education. Well, how can we rethink education itself? You know, the fundamental questions that we've been talking about in our organizations, why do we educate people? What is the, what is the purpose of education? And how can we structure our practice and what needs to be done, what could be done, what should be done? These are the discussions. And I'd like to sort of leave with, uh, with the whole idea of there are openings because we are not alone in this discussion. At UNESCO itself, there is a huge undertaking underway called the Futures of Education. You know, we've been working with the Dolores Commission uh, for the, the past 10, 15 years. We've been talking about the purpose of education being to know, to do, to be, and to live together. And now we're saying that was fine in 1996, but so much has changed. 
And so what does the futures of education, what can we rethink education for 2050? And at the same time, we're working with uh, ESD for 2030. So how, how can we start using our particular expertise? Now, I've just been talking largely about uh, the school setting and, and about teaching. And so now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Olympia, maybe th through Martin, first of all, but uh, talking about learning, uh, you know, as, as another approach. So I hope these few comments will be useful to stimulate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Martin? Charles, thank you very much. Uh, some very interesting and thought-provoking ideas there about uh, you know, building back better, looking at, I'm, I'm really scared about your comment about one billion people on the move uh, in, in the next while. I mean, with an issue like COVID, how do you, how do you control, uh, you know, a virus like that if you have one billion people moving? That, that is, a, that's, a, that's a frightening, that is a frightening possibility. Yeah. Um, I think if we could, I'd love to get people's response immediately to Charles and then maybe get Olympia to come in with a few comments. Would that be okay, Olympia? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, would people like to ask any questions, raise any issues, or bring up any comments from Charles's um, input there, please? If you'll allow me, I can see in the chat Anton has, come, has a question or maybe a comment also. Is it all about our attitude? Uh, maybe he can okay. share. Yeah, I think uh, what has to change is it's more it's it's more our attitude that has to change and our moral compass to uh, changing from care for me towards care for all, care for me the profit side, care for all the total environment. Charles, how how do you look look at this? Yeah, I um, thanks, Andrew. I I would agree. You know it. In our, in our meetings, we've been talking about the pursuit of well-being and, and what, is, uh, what constitutes well-being beyond well-off. Right? But the question I think now, in building on what you're saying, is how do we address well-being of all? You know, because if, if we all pursue our own particular well-being, um, we can project that that may not be the best thing in, in, in the larger. The idea, can anyone really be well, well off if others are suffering? You know, we can have, we can be financially wealthy, but not necessarily have that well-being if we're surrounded by people who are actually struggling. Yeah. I think it's a great aspect, yes. Hey, anyone else would like to raise an issue, ask a question on this one? Any other comments? Or um, responses? I think, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I think, oh, sorry. But, you know, I'm, I'm a practitioner, so I'm, I'm starting straight away to think uh, in practical, uh, how, do, how do you do it? And what I think we need to do, um, is to uh, to look at exactly what it is we want uh, with our society and what we want with kids. For now, the um, main thing in schools are skills like uh, learning to to uh, write and do math and uh, very much in your head things. And we are kind of uh, not spending so much time on being connected to nature or creativity. And I think we have to to reevaluate what's important, because of course it's still important to be able to write and read and do math, but maybe it's even more important in the future to, to have this, uh, to keep this uh, natural nature connectedness that children they're actually born with, but that they lose over the years, because when we, 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 we role models and we don't show them that we need to respect nature and we need to um, take care of our environment. And I think that's one of the main things we need to get. We need to get into uh, education now that we have the chance uh, because of this crisis. Um, yeah. What do you think, Charles? <laughs> well, 
I, I, I agree. I think that's why we need to go back. Uh, we're observing that uh, with students out of, out of school and, and so many of them not on online learning. You know, uh, but the teachers are saying it's okay. They, they have missed some time, but uh, it, it, is, it is not all that crucial. We'll be able to, to build back. That's a very different approach from our in pre-pandemic uh, in saying we don't have time for field trips, right? We, we, we can't do that because they would miss Im important things in class. So suddenly we have changed our story. And I think that what we, if we go back to the fundamentals of why are we educating people, what are some really important understandings that everyone must have? And whether they're environmental understandings or whether they're social structure understandings and so on, uh, what are these basic things and how do we script these? How do we position them within our education systems? And certainly getting back to, to fundamental links. How does a tree grow? You know, uh, the, the idea that everything is interconnected and so on. I don't want to go on because this is just, you know, a little touch it. So I, I, I agree uh, totally with you, Berta. And in that, this, remember the, the diagram that I put up about with the whole school approach? What we need to do is another whole school approach, another whole school approach, another, and then connecting these until we learn our way forward in the whole school system approaches. And then we start talking international linkages. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Charles. Just two, two very quick things have come up. Uh, Tim, you mentioned about safe havens. Do you want to comment on that? And uh, Alana, you also talked about technological inequality. Would you like to kind of just elaborate a little bit on that as well, please? Tim, to start? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, again, one of the benefits of all this uh, has maybe helped uh, a certain group of parents to actually appreciate what actually goes on in school uh, in terms of not just, uh, not just the learning, but, but maybe the teacher's ability to crowd control when they've not even been able to crowd control two or three of them in their own homes. Um, but also that to illustrate that um, thinking about the UK uh, and the children who have had to have had local supermarkets provide packed lunches, uh, that kind of thing, where the school is not just. And uh, I, I, Fran, I, 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 I can see you nodding there because uh, when you mentioned before um, about the uh, the children with English as a second language. There, there are also the, the cultural attitudes towards, you said 30% handing work back in. Um, and okay, it, it, it was rotten timing at the best of times, but uh, it happened during Ramadan as well, where certain communities are under uh, different rhythms of the day uh, and different pressures. Uh, so one of the things that I would like to come out of this, and it, it does link to our sustainability uh, mission, I think, is what exactly does a school do? Yeah. That's a very good question, Jim. I mean, I think it's one that has to be, maybe we, as Charles suggests, we need to rethink this one. What is the function of school? What, yeah. should be the, what should be the priorities in school? Is it about standardized testing? Or is it about actually developing, as Dewey suggested 100 years ago, you know, social and democratic human beings who actually know how to mine each other and this planet that we live on? Right. And, and maybe, maybe we need to rethink something around this. Yeah, and I, I, I've been revisiting a little bit of uh, Ken Robinson's uh, ideas about creativity and the the role of the school as a kind of a societal functioner to train people to know their place when they get out of the production line at the other end um, but what what you mentioned testing what I would be very interested in uh, to going back to the, the the big question of what do schools do I'd like to know exactly how much have the children really missed by not being inside that building with the other children. 
And it would be a very interesting piece of research to say, you, you, uh, I'm sorry, somebody far more clever than me mentioned before the word resilience. Um, are these children going to be resilient and simply they will not have fallen behind? And, 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 and there may be a group of people who wish that the teachers were back in school because heaven knows they get enough holidays anyway. <laughs> Could I just bring Alana in there, just to ask you, Alana, if you want to comment on your comment there on technological inequality, because I think that is a big issue, certainly here in Ireland, there has been a lot of issues around the actual digital capacity of schools to provide proper technology for students to support them when they're not in school. And it has raised quite an interesting debate here. So any comments from you on that one? Yeah, I, I'm taking on board Tim's point. Um, I just think that um, there's a spectrum of provision and a spectrum of capacity that teachers have in relation to technology. Very often the next generation are way ahead of the teachers, maybe even way ahead of their parents even. But it's access would be a key issue for me. First of all, in terms of the technology in terms of, like I heard you mention, Charles, about the satellites and having good communication systems. We have a huge digital divide in Ireland about who has good and quick broadband. Not a mind who has access to a screen. And so I think one thing would be providing equality of access so that, first of all, children at least could self-direct their own engagement. Now, I come from a health motion background, so I don't want to be encouraging too much screen time either but I don't want to seem Luddite and against the technology because I think it's a great, it could be a very good equalizer in terms of allowing people with disabilities. And um, you know, you're, you can have your own persona online and children can adapt how they want to present their work in lots of different ways, maybe more than in real life. So their technology offers potential and challenges. So that was my thinking, but we have to make sure first of all, that there's um, equality of access. Okay. Um, maybe take a couple of other comments. Uh, Aidan, you, you mentioned if no. I could ask you there about redefining education. Can you want to mm. comment on that one? Yes, I'm, I'm interested in the, uh, uh, Charles mentioned Delore and all, all that, uh, that publication. And I think it's very important that we do revisit what we mean by education. Uh, and my, my sense at the moment is, while we're talking about well-being, that's one of the dimension of it. But it is all about uh, relationships and how we develop positive relationships. And I think we need to really expand on that idea, uh, you know, because that's a relationship with the environment, with society, with, with ourselves, whatever. But it is a process of um, uh, developing positive relationships. And I think uh, in, in a new era, I mean, we have to look at that in a much deeper way. And I think out of that then become, uh, you know, will spring the necessity for particular items on the curriculum, the necessity for different approaches. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and it will be fit for purpose automatically if we, if we look at the deeper meaning behind uh, the education process and what it's all about. And I still think we have to, there's an awful lot of exploration to be done in that area. Uh, yet before we get it right. My worry is that we're all looking at um, aspects of things rather than looking at the deeper meaning. And we can spend a myriad, an infinity of time in the uh, subset of activities, uh, but not changing anything fundamentally. So I think uh, it's some time spent on, on that would be very important. And particularly within the, uh, the issue of sustainable development, I think it becomes even more, more important. Okay. Thank you. There's a, what you're saying is there's a real onus on teachers to take a bit more proactive uh, you know, role in, in, in redefining education then, rather than wait for policymakers or wait for anybody yeah. else. Is it our, our job to do this? Yeah, I, I would go as far as saying that, yeah, that there is, it's not just a top down, it's a total, it's the whole, uh, environment and we should be as teachers asking about our relationship 
uh, with our students, our relationship with the institutions we're working in, our relationships with ourselves. But that's one aspect. The student has to take responsibility of asking what is their relationship to their subject, to, the, to each other, to, what, to, to society. The same goes for parents. It is a, comp a complex, while it may be very simple, the whole, it is quite complex. But I think we have to start looking at things from, a, and I'm talking about positive relationships here, um, because you can develop negative relationships like addiction and whatever. But I mean, there's, I'm talking about within the context of uh, positive relationships that uh, uh, bring about a flourishing humanity, but not only, a, but also a flourishing world, a flourishing life on this planet. So that's how I'm, I'm seeing it, yes. I'm sorry I came in late. Um, I'm uh, I think there's uh, the connection is not very good. Yeah. With somebody who tried to say no. something. Thank you. Martin, can you hear me? I was just uh, trying to confirm. Uh, Damiana, can you can you hear me? Well, probably it's just the local connection. Uh, I can hear very well. Yeah. yeah, so it's probably local. It's not from uh, from me. I'm hosting the Zoom meeting. I have seen a comment uh, from Susan. She was trying to say something like, "I have a comment on learning." Uh, if Susan would like to say it, uh, Susan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Olympia. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to pick up what Charles says about also rethink the learning and the learning process, not only the reconstruction of education institutions because I found this point really very interesting and I think in this time now where we are more um, stuck at home and maybe it's also a period to come back to the ground to rethink and I think for learning the question learning for life what does it mean we we have this like in the daily talk, so ah, you go to school for life, you learn for life, not for, not for an exam and so on. But nowadays, I think we could give new answers to the question, what does it mean, learn for life and learning for life? And in connection with the, with the um, care of sustainable development and, and nature, but maybe also um different groups in the society um, um more diverse um perspectives on society so i think we could have come up if we want to build better um with new answers to this question what does it mean learning to, for life and this would be very nice if we could find new topics and new a new focus also for the school um, and for the children to be in there and to and to receive an education which is really for life and and not just a saying oh you learn for life believe it or not <laughs> yeah that's what i want to say and share can i can i just come back to that suzanne because i think that's brilliant and uh, yeah. i thought i had the the, the early bit of, of what you were saying uh, reminded me of something I was reading recently uh, about educational theory. Now, I think many of you know I, I'm not an academic uh, and I do not aspire to be one, but sometimes I pick up something from Google Scholar that's interesting. Uh, and there is this new idea that um, the, 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 the behaviorist theory and the constructivist theory there is now this new idea of the connectivist theory mm -hmm. where, uh, where knowledge actually exists in the cloud in cyberspace and learning is all about how to access that knowledge. Yeah. And uh, when you were, 
when you were saying at the beginning of that, I thought, yes, uh, I, I really would like to share that with everybody as, a, as, as, as the basis of what you're recommending. Yeah, and I think it's also in nature, you know, nature is also a kind of interconnected knowledge. It's not only in, in, the, in the digital world, it's also in our surrounding and, and we can learn so much from it. So I, I spent now one year in Latin America also with indigenous um, groups. So there you can learn so much about interconnectedness. And so, you know, so somehow we can build on both sides. Of course, on one hand, on the digital modern way of communication, but it's, I think for the children, it's also very important to have these um, primary experiences um, and face to face experiences in the nature, with the nature, and in a surrounding. They also feel as a person who is able to take care for something. And this would be really nice if these things together with, with, um, the the relevant learning topics that could be more more focused and really find a bit i think it would be nice if the law could really go into the schools because we have so many years knowing about it but if you look at the curricula it's still not in and this is something that seems unbelievable for me and to rebuild and to build better would mean for me come on let's do the steps now and not talk, 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 and never do something on it. Olympia, am I being able Perfect. to hear? Excellent. Okay, Thank I'm just watching, I'm just watching like time. Fun. Yeah, just watching time, Olympia. So if I could, I'm just going to ask if Olympia might like to maybe do a talk for a few minutes about her perspective. Uh, Olympia Messe yeah. has, Messe has, is the president of our own uh, inter instructional design company which uh, delivers both corporate and educational programs online and in person. So Olympia is coming from a very different perspective here, but could open up a, a, another element for a, a conversation. Uh, Olympia is also the founder of the Book to Course Online School, which teaches, uh, which teaches authors how to transform their work uh, into online academies. And she's also the author of a book, How Children Learn. It's a book for children between six and 12 years of age and parents on the whole idea of the neuroscience of learning. So Olympia is just going to talk for a few minutes about her kind of thoughts on sustainable education in that kind of context. And maybe it just might feed into our, our thinking just a little bit further. So and over I'll to you, Olympia. Thank you. I already shared the screen. I hope you can see if you do. Yeah. Uh, can you say something? Yes, you do. Uh, yeah, as, you can can see, uh, as you can see on my screen, um, uh, there are two pictures. Uh, in one of them is me and my son, and in the other one, is, there's a teacher with some kids. On both of them, you'll see two hashtags. Do you see the hashtags? Impact beyond the book and impact beyond the classroom. Uh, these two hashtags have been the hashtags of my learning design agency, where we design learning not for children, but for adults in the corporate environment. Uh, so many, many managers uh, attending our leadership courses, for example, they were saying that, like, let me show you. So we have this book here and we would teach them on uh, how the brain works based on maybe uh, something from the neuroscience of uh, how not to postpone things for later, how not to you know, procrastinate or how to organize the business life. And they would say, yeah, but I know all of that. I I've read that book. And then uh, when we ask them, but can you look at this book and tell me that you are 100% what you know from the book? Like you actually are that kind of person in real life. And they say, no, I'm not totally that. I just know the, I know the knowledge, you know, I have the knowledge. So, and then we've seen that there is this gap in between what we know and what we actually do beyond the book that we read or beyond the classroom of a leadership or coaching uh, session. And then in time, I realized that there is also a gap between 
what we are taught in school, the, uh, what we understood in school that intelligence is, and then what uh, we implemented and what we used from what we learned in school in the corporate world or in the business world. And there was a huge gap in between this and that. And, and uh, young children keep saying to me this today, yeah, but why do I, why do I learn this? Do I really need this when I will be uh, hired on my first job? Uh, and it's very interesting because uh, the moment we focus only on the knowledge, uh, then we cannot embed this and we are not able to impact beyond the classroom or beyond the book. So I was very frustrated by this. At the same time in my corporate, let's say, life uh, where I was designing learning, I met brilliant educators from private schools at the beginning, they were coming to my workshops to learn my methodology of learning design based on some neuroscience stuff. And I was amazed and I was asking them, so this is, this is actually a high, a high price ticket, so why did you come? The name of the course is uh, creating high power corporate courses. So why do you come from from you know from a school? This is not for you. And they were no no no. We know what you teach about. Let me stay. Okay. And they was they were sitting there and participating. And what we were doing different was uh, teaching teaching through this uh, uh, a, a new framework of how to design learning in a way that it's not just knowledge it's life itself when you go back into the world because the business world is this is what they ask they do not ask you to teach people knowledge when they ask you for a training session they ask you to transform a salesperson who's not selling into a salesperson who's selling tomorrow or in after a two-day uh, course so when then i then i thought uh, okay, so if this is useful for education, then maybe I could do some pro bono work uh, for educators. And this is how my journey in education started. And uh, I will share with you. So uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote this book. It was published last year uh, on the neuroscience of learning. And I've decided because I have a son, he's 12 years old, as I showed you, he's on the picture uh, I just shared. Uh, I've, I've observed that every time we were reading something or uh, learning something new, it was very, he was very uh, enthusiastic when we were actually implementing those things in real life. And, and so I, I, every time he was struggling, I was trying to explain to them, uh, to, to him from neuroscience, what was happening in the brain and how intelligence grows. And because this was helpful, I just wrote that everything I've used with my son in this book. And I said, this is going to be for children and parents, although teachers love this book more. But I do not want to talk to teachers uh, about this because, as Susan said, I think this is life and it's about engaging parents and everybody else around, like the business people, the entrepreneurs, everybody should contribute so that learning happens in a different way from now on. And what we did, uh, what we do with teach, uh, children, now I have a lot of webinars. So only this month uh, I've joined schools and I, I did uh, pro bono webinars on how people learn with children. And I was asked, I asked them at the beginning, so if I look I scan all of your brains. Whom do you think is the most intelligent one in this classroom? And they laugh at the beginning, so ha ha ha, this is, uh, you know, amusing. Uh, but then we, we look at what they think intelligence is and try to redefine it. So if I, if I ask you right now, what do you think intelligence is? Can you, uh, I don't know, can you imagine your, your child? What would you write in the chat? and actually write it. Imagine you are only nine years old and I'm asking you, what do you think being intelligent mean? What is intelligence? What would you write as a nine year old? Let's see, let's do this experiment because this is about redefining how we look at things uh, today and how we'll look at this maybe from now on. Let me see what is in the chat. Being able to pass the test. Well, yes, you're right and I get this get 10 spelling correct intelligence yeah understanding something i don't know exactly yes good at school i love this one 
able to understand. Teacher likes me. Thank you, Alana. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is really, well, actually many of them say that, but then we get into the neuroscience of learning and thank you for, for be, uh, playing with me on this one. And then we get into the neuroscience of learning and I uh, explained to them that when we learn something, it doesn't matter in what area of our lives, uh, it might be uh, in school or outside the school, uh, in the brain, when you learn something new, it's like my Range Rover trying to make a new pathway on a very high grass next to a forest. And if I go once only on this road, what will happen? Who knows? Damiana, if I, I go only once with the Range Rover uh, on the grass, but only once, what will happen to the grass in the evening? Will it grow back? That knows. Yeah. Yes, Martin says yes. Yes, it will. It will grow back in the evening. Only if I go with, only if I go with my Range Rover many, many times through the same row, uh, then uh, I will create a path. And I show to them how in time, uh, the way we learn in the brain is not like we we do it in, with a computer. We enter and we have everything here, and the skill we need for school or everything, the knowledge and the memory is there. No, if we uh, go with this Range Rover learning and relearning and again, then we will create new neural pathways and they learn about plasticity. If not, look what they will get, what we get in the brain, rusty things or houses that no longer exist. Like my French, I was very good with French, not anymore because I haven't used it for 20 years. So they learn about plasticity. And then after that, we talk about the many things people learn every day and some of them and actually many of them are related to as you shared earlier to uh what is actually life and many of you said in the conversation that's why i was like ah oh, i was so joyful when i hearing you indeed learning is not only uh the academic stuff you learn in school is everything else also in life and i think this is a great opportunity today uh, looking at how parents struggle at home with everything in managing life itself and then the academics uh to redefine what intelligence is and uh, we define it with children and if at the beginning the st they say that intelligence is doing great with grades and by the end of the uh, webinar, when they understand how intelligence is built in the brain, and I ask them, what if I want to learn to ride a bike? Is this the same process in the brain? Yes, yes. What if uh, I want to drive a car and I learn how to drive it? Is it the same process, neuroplasticity and everything in the brain? Yes, yes. What if I open the fridge and I pay attention to what we eat today. Is that in building intelligence? Yes. What if when I go uh, past the street and I see somebody who is on the street, sleeping on the street, and I ask my parents why this happens, and we discuss about it, and then I Google what, the, what, this, what poverty means. Is that building intelligence? But yes, of course. And so, uh, uh, step by step, what they learn in the webinar is that building intelligence is more than the grades, is more than the academics, math, history, and uh, all the others. It's life itself and everything we do and decide every day. Uh, I even included uh, at the end of the book a challenge, 70 day brain challenge. Uh, this is the cover and they have challenges for 17 days that are very simple things they can embed in their life, like change, challenge them, themselves with something so that they build the neural pathways for that specific goal. But I'm not teaching them that this is a goal uh, from, uh, from the, you know, 2030, nothing. It's just that um, I keep the logo just for the teachers and the parents so that they know that this is a connection. Children do not, they just open the fridge and they research online if the food they eat uh, is good for them, is healthy, and how the food got into their fridge. Or they research on a, on a second day, um, if the toy they play with, they have a salt toy, uh, is uh, healthy for the planet if I throw it away. And then they have this challenge the second day, and they, oh my God, so how, what do you mean? I mean, 
look up online with your parents and tell me if your uh, kitten, like you throw it away in 20 years, is this healthy for the planet? I never thought about it. Oh, okay. So, uh, and will that be intelligence? Yet, yes, it will. So going back to what you're saying, uh, why, why did I start doing this? Is because I believe that, strongly believe that we should not teach children entrepreneurship without sustainability. I'm from, if we start now early on and we teach them to be entrepreneurs and usually teachers or parents start with selling lemonade how about selling lemonade, but not, not necessarily, uh, I, I don't do that with my son. You know what, how I teach him uh, entrepreneurship? We take the eggs, the cover of the egg, we clean it, when we ma smash it, and uh, I propose to him, let's sell this as an ingredient for plants to our neighbors, because this is healthier for the planet, and you'll also get some money for this. Uh, anyway, we are throwing away the, you know, the cover, uh, the, how do you call it, uh, Martin? You should know it in English. You know, the egg is in a... Egg shell. Yeah, yeah, shell, yes. So this is a business. This is a sustainable uh, entrepreneurship building. Selling uh, egg shells, uh, not lemonade and consuming stuff. So I believe if we start early on teaching entrepreneurship, only with sustainability and a leadership also only with sustainability in mind, then definitely, um, definitely the leaders, the next generation leaders will be different. So my question to you would be today, uh, not, not a, another question, uh, an imaginative exercise, and I put it on screen. So imagine the world with only entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur here, so I'm not an educator. Uh, educated only with sustainability or leaders, presidents, uh, I don't know, governors who are educated this way only with sustainability in mind. And this is possible if you approach education like we approach business. When I, when I talk to a business person and I ask the, uh, the, the manager, so what do you want by the end of this training? What the results, I'm, I'm try, I'm, we're starting from the, from the end. What are you trying to achieve? And they tell me, I want this and this. And then, okay, what are the skills we need to master this? And then we go to the knowledge. What, what knowledge do we need to master this? And then we get the theoretical part. And then we, the last question is, what must a learner value differently, appreciate differently to master this? I mean, the number four. And if we, if we take this framework, and take it into the education on a higher level, like the level Charles is working with. And we ask ourselves, what do we measure in education? Do we measure how many sustainability entrepreneurs we will create? Then this is what we'll get. If we don't measure that, we measure different things and we will get different things. At the level of a school leader, what do we measure? How many entrepreneurs with sustainability in mind we create, or um, I don't know, maybe lawyers with sustainability in mind, then this is what we will get. If not, then we'll get a different result. So this is my new framework for you. It comes from the business world, uh, but a different kind of business world that I believe in, the one where you create business with purpose and for people. And if it's helpful, then I'm inviting you into a dialogue about this and uh, maybe a debate if you do not agree. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Olympia. Again, that's just another very interesting perspective on how we think about education and coming at it from that business neuroscience model. Uh, and again, I think just stimulating our thinking a little bit. Uh, so I'm just conscious of time. Uh, would anyone like to respond, uh, Orly? To that or any comments, please. Tim, For me, you, it, it, sorry, go ahead. Tim, Tim was smiling all the time. What you were smiling about, Tim? Ah, let me unmute you. Yeah, just one second, you're on mute. Uh, why can I unmute? Un so tell me, tell me now. Yeah, I'm there. Um, it was I, I was I was trying to connect it to the connectivity that I was talking about earlier, uh, and that um, the the second slide that you showed, I was sort of really pleased that it actually related to what 
Suzanne, uh, you're all in different places on my screen here, uh, that Suzanne was talking about uh, as well, this sort of online and offline connectivity. Um, and uh, I was also slightly uh, being self-indulgent about driving a four by four off-road. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, I'm just very conscious of time and I, I, we said we'd have this for an hour. So can I just first of all say a very special thanks to Charles and Olympia for those very interesting contributions and stimulating our thinking. Uh, I think as educators, it leaves us with a problem. How do we as educators now decide to redesign and rethink what we need to do in education? What do we need to change? And I do think that we should be advocates for change and not wait for other people and policymakers maybe to tell us what we what we know we need to do. That's just my final comment, but I would be very interested if anyone has any other thoughts they would like to add. Charles? Hi. Anything? Sorry. Martin, this is Joanne. Joanne. Hi, How Martin, doing, this Joanne? is Joanne. How are you? Greetings to everyone from Ireland, a very sunny Ireland today. Thank you for a really stimulating conversation. My gosh, so many perspectives offered. I, my, my head was boggling. Um, I made a comment earlier, Martin, and I think it kind of reflects on your question. Um, I suppose from the Irish and European context at the moment, I do have some concerns in terms of government prioritization, especially in the face of the deep recession that we are entering into. And I think that advocacy is actually, I'm working teacher education, and I think advocacy is possibly one of the, the biggest things that I can contribute at the moment, whether it is advocacy at school level, at um, college level, at government policy level, etc. Because we are lucky in Ireland, we do have the policy infrastructure that focuses on global citizenship, um, education for sustainable development outcomes and indicators within our policy. But I think Olympia's contribution there was really interesting in that perhaps until there is value placed on assessing these effective outcomes they may never be truly valued in education so I think those are my comments amongst many I have to admit on the back of two contributions today so thank you again Thank you very much Joanne for that um, I think that's a very valid point and I'd, I'd just like to I'm going to, I'm going to, does anyone have any other comments they'd like to make because I am conscious of the time and I don't want to keep people too long Okay, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to say to everybody, thank you so much for participating in a really interesting and a very stimulating conversation today. Uh, the network will be back soon with another webinar. Uh, we will certainly be looking at inviting people in it maybe next month or a little later to another webinar on a different topic related to sustainable education and maybe current issues or maybe a, a, a second look at where we're at with COVID-19. We will discuss that later. Uh, in the meantime, can I ask everybody to please stay safe. Thank you for joining us today. It was a real pleasure and a real privilege. And we will look forward to meeting you again very soon in the Learning Teacher Network. Take care, everybody, and bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, Mark. Thank you all. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Martin. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. Bye. Somebody bye -bye. asked about the slides. I think uh, only if Elma has all the details, she will be able to share with you anything. So if you just join through social media, maybe it's wise to let us know your email address and Elma will yeah. make the notes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Elma. Thanks, sure. Michael. Hello, Bill. Thank you, Elma, for your support. Hello, It was my pleasure. Good to see you. Are we all good? Yeah, thank, thank you, me. Martin, for facilitating, and Elma and Damiana. And yeah, thank there. you so much. You're very welcome. Hi, nice to see you, Elisa. Good, good to see you. Good to see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great to see some lovely, bye -bye. familiar faces.
<laughs> yeah. Very good to talk yeah, together like, again. <laughs> feels like home. <laughs> yeah. Very <laughs> cool. All we need now is a glass of wine and a chat. In the bar. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> or beer in the pub. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Damiana, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine, thanks. And you? Oh, good. It's too cold here still. Really? <laughs> oh. 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 Only something like minus, uh, not minus, uh, plus 10, 5 to 10. Okay, okay. That's, it. That's better than minus something. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> well, we had, we had snow two weeks ago, more snow. Oh. <laughs> not... But it melts very quickly. Yeah. So it's yeah, very thanks. nice to see all your faces there. And oh, yeah. Same. 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 It's very nice to see you too, really. Yep. So take care and see you again soon. See you and, and take care. Yeah, you too. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Helen. Take care. Good to see you again. Okay. Uh, Michael, how are you? You didn't say a word today. I'm very good. I'm very good at Olympia. Good. Uh, good to hear that. A very stimulating, very stimulating conversations there. Yes. Uh, and we yeah, have... I think it was a very, very good conversation. Oh, hello, Bill. I didn't really see you earlier. Hello. <laughs> yeah, hi, Bill. <laughs> so quiet in the corner. <laughs> Hello, Suzanne. Bill, Bill, you, 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 Bill, Bill is never quiet in the corner. <laughs> never. He, went, he went to get the beer. <laughs> yeah, he, <did. laughs> he went to get hey, the beer. Have a glass of wine there, Bill, please. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a good idea, Martin. <laughs>